Perfect. And we can move on to the next talk by Claudio Greco, a DFT study of the influences of key amino acid mutation on local structural feature and folding of acetyl-CoA synthase. I thank the organizers for having me invited to uh, show me uh, show you some of the uh, results on this enzyme we have started to study uh, in the last uh, months. So essentially, this kind of enzyme is a very interesting one, as it is able is a bifunctional enzyme, which is able basically to uh, produce CO2 starting from uh, from CO. So it is a, a, an enzyme that is able. Uh, to make a chemistry which is very relevant not only from a biochemical point of view but also uh, from an environmental point of view uh, and also in the context for example of horizon 2020 uh, co2 has a certain role and so this might be interesting uh, on the other uh, from the other point of view on the other uh, functional point of this big enzyme here we have uh, another uh, active area uh, in which, with an active site, which is called A cluster here, which is able to uh, use the CO produced in the other reaction to produce basically acetyl uh, coenzyme A, uh, starting also from a, a CH3 plus uh, cation. So uh, we have been focusing in particular uh, for the moment on this part of the story, on this uh, active site here, uh, which has some particular features. First of all, it's a, a essentially an exonuclear complex, which is composed by an iron force of a four cluster here, a rather classical one, so <clears throat> basically not different from the one in, uh, commonly found in pyridoxines. And then there is a dinickel uh, site here, which is the site which is really uh, directly involved in the chemistry of this enzyme. Uh, these two uh, subclusters are joined uh, to each other uh, by means of a cysteine here. Uh, which is the system 509 in the sequence of the protein. So there are many uh, possibilities for the catalytic uh, mechanism uh, the, of this uh, enzyme active site, but uh, we have to say, I want just to point out this, that these different views basically uh, are uh, different, different in terms of the role of this uh, uh, iron force of four cluster here uh, and uh, also on the uh, redox state of the nickel uh, clusters, uh, or the nickel cluster, or the nickel atoms in the di-nickel uh, cluster. Uh, basically, uh, some authors, Fontesilla Camps in particular, has uh, been uh, proposing that uh, this iron force of four cluster is important in terms of redox chemistry, so to transfer, uh, reducing equivalence towards the dinuclear di cluster here, and then all the chemistry basically uh, happens at the level of this nickel ion, uh, which is called proximal because it's close to the iron four sulfur four cluster. But other authors have been arguing that this cluster is actually always in the plus two redox state and it's unable to transfer any electron. And the role might be, in this case, basically to allow the localization of charge, which might uh, have, uh, allow to uh, stabilize a uh, low valent nickel, uh, proximal nickel. So one of the approaches that uh, biochemists use normally when they don't know what's uh, going on in a protein is to make mutations. And in this case, a group of tan, uh, in, uh, and tan uh, co-workers have been trying actually to mutate this uh, cysteine here to uh, see what could happen to the enzyme after mutation in terms of activity, uh, basically. Uh, one of the mutations they uh, tested was this uh, uh, cysteine to histidine mutation, uh, other one towards alanine, serine, and valine. Quite uh, interestingly, what they found was that uh, functionality uh, of this uh, active site was conserved only when there was a uh, mutation towards histidine. Uh, it's quite surprising also because, for example, serine, Obviously, uh, the mutation towards serine uh, would just uh, uh, exchange this sulfur with an oxygen, but this kills completely the activity of the enzyme. So if we uh, consider uh, this uh, uh, mutation towards histidine in particular, we have to consider that basically we substitute a sulfur atom with an imidazole ring 
which is obviously much bulkier, and what uh, the authors uh, of the mutational study have been uh, uh, proposing, also because they uh, tend to favor, in some sense, and to support the idea that the R iron force of cluster is important for delocalization of charge, is that basically the histidine here is uh, put in between the two subclusters, just replacing also from a spatial, a spatial point of view the uh, cysteine 509. Now, uh, the point that might be interesting to, to study here is the following. Is it actually possible to substitute in this way a cysteine with a, a imidazole ring? This is what we have been trying to, to uh, study. So uh, right now this mutational study has three years, uh, so it's three years old. Uh, and uh, even if the uh, authors uh, of this study have been uh, promising in some sense uh, crystallographic uh, analysis of the protein, probably they are having problems to <laughs> crystallize it. Proteins are nasty uh, systems in which it's not that easy sometimes to crystallize even after one single uh, mutation of a residue. So the first step we uh, took was to consider uh, an isolated model of the uh, active site and just have a look at the, uh, let's say, conformational reorganization of, the, uh, of this A cluster. After that, we uh, substitute the cysteine with here, wild type form, with the imidazole ring. What is interesting to notice is that basically this uh, active site, in, so uh, calculated with DFT in vacuum, expands by more than three uh, angstroms. And here the que question is again, obviously, would the, the protein matrix uh, actually allow such a reorganization at the level of the A cluster? If we want to answer to this question, we have some methodological problem, most probably. Uh, first of all, because we can obviously here not use a, a molecular mechanics approach, because we even don't know the bonding uh, of this system, of this uh, A cluster in the mutated form. We cannot use a standard uh, cluster QM, uh, QM cluster model because in this case, uh, basically, we might expect that there is a, a, let's say, a large scale reorganization of the structure of the protein, and so we would not be able to know where to cut uh, the enzyme uh, at, at which point. And obviously, there is also the point that constraints itself, in this case, should be avoided because basically we uh, uh, want to uh, reproduce the enzyme in the, the environment of the A cluster without any kind of constraints. So basically what we have been thinking is that we should uh, produce a DFT model which is large enough to reproduce the uh, constraints imposed by the protein matrix on the A cluster but small enough to allow the calculation at the DFT level to actually uh, proceed in a computer nowadays. So the first thing to do in this case, uh, we were thinking, was to analyze the uh, protein which actually harbors the A cluster a little bit more in details. And what we can see, basically, is that all the residues which are covalently linked to the uh, A cluster, so four cysteines uh, on the, around the iron force of cluster, two cysteines at the level of the dinical cluster, and also glycine here, are all uh, connected along the uh, backbone of the protein at the level of this blue area here. So this suggests that we might start cutting our uh, system and see what happens, basically, in terms of size. So this region, uh, which I uh, uh, was speaking of, uh, about before, is more or less 1,500 atoms big. And so it's still a little bit large, let's say. So we have to look a little bit better in it. We have to maybe use as much as possible our biochemical skills and uh, have a, uh, just some new ideas about how to cut a little bit more, but keeping the constraints in a fair way on the A, uh, a cluster. And what we see here is that there is a, a, a quite large area, quite far from the A cluster, which is a, a very full, a very uh, rich in loops, okay? And that, that might be, so therefore, not particularly rigid. We might think, for example, to cut this away. And then, at this point, we get to the heart of the protein, let's say, uh, also from a point of view of shape. 
And uh, this is a 990 uh, atoms big uh, model, it would be. We decided to go a little bit uh, to make some other uh, simplification of, of uh, our system. And we considered that after having cut in this way, we basically have that uh, uh, we don't have all the rest of the protein matrix. So it's not that needed to uh, keep all the residues at the peripheral area of our model uh, in the way they are. For example, just consider here we have a tryptophan. Why not uh, changing it to a glycine? So, because it doesn't have to make the normal uh, hydrophobic uh, interaction that uh, tryptophan is usually used uh, to uh, fold a protein the proper way. So we mutate all this uh, yellow uh, residues to glycine, and we get to the final model, which is a 700 uh, atoms big uh, model, which can be thought to be uh, in, treated at DFT level. Which kind of model did we uh, use? Which, my, which kind of level of theory? Basically, the A cluster was uh, treated at BP86 SPP uh, level. We used, obviously, broken symmetry. We kept uh, the uh, spin coupling uh, at the broken symmetry level uh, always the same in the various models I will uh, show you using our approach to uh, localize spins on the atoms. And then we have all the protein matrix, uh, which uh, is treated at BP86 SV level. Uh, there, obviously, we don't need so much polarization, at least this is the hope. For the moment, we have been considering only the reduced uh, form of the A cluster, and the overall system is therefore minus four in charge, and the calculations were done in a vacuum. So let's consider, first of all, the structural feature of the uh, wild-type uh, model of the protein treated in this way. And what uh, is interesting to see is that after optimization, uh, basically, the uh, RMSD uh, of this model with respect to the crystal structure is rather low, around 0.76 angstrom. So we can say that this model is able to reproduce the uh, constraints of the protein matrix on the A cluster rather uh, fairly. So we made a step forward. We tried to fit uh, histidine uh, in where there was a cysteine before in the wild type uh, form of the enzyme. And we find out that uh, the connectivity actually changes along uh, the optimization. We have basically that one of the nitrogen of the histidine detaches. And as a whole, one has here that the, the pi system of the histidine goes to interact with the nickel. This is a kind of uh, coordination that nobody as far as we know, has ever seen in biochemistry. So it's a little bit suspicious. We have also considered the other rotom of the histidine here. The situation is rather similar. There is another rupture of a, a bond. And what is uh, uh, interesting is also that this uh, second model is uh, around uh, 26 uh, kcal per mole less stable than uh, the previous one. So let's try actually to, uh, at this point, uh, change a little bit the structural feature of our model, move a little bit the, the backbone, such that we allow that kind of uh, enlargement of the uh, uh, cavity that uh, harbors the A cluster. And let's try to uh, actually have what the experimentalists were uh, proposing for their uh, mutant. Uh, we actually were able to obtain uh, a model having uh, this kind of connectivity here. And what is quite interesting to see is that uh, the energy we get is 26.5 kcal per mole rest, less with respect to uh, the uh, uh, previous model I, I showed you uh, before. And uh, well, 26.5 kcal per mole is uh, more or less the energy, the enthalpy uh, of folding of small proteins. So these are quite huge energies for, for proteins. So, we can also say that, yes, in the previous model, the strain, therefore, imposed by the protein matrix on the, on the cluster is very high. This is another way to say more or less the same thing. Let's have a look also at what we can say using the FT result on the folding of this protein on this mutant, uh, having done all the considerations I, I exposed. Uh, and uh, this, is what, this is the portion of the protein here that we have to move. We have to move from the crystal position, the completely blue one, to the one of the model that allows uh, the histidine to be uh, 
double co doubly coordinated to uh, both the iron four super four and the nickel uh, side. We have a 6.6 .6 angstrom uh, displacement, basically, of the backbone at the level of the first residue that would be really free to rotate and to move. 6.6 .6 angstrom is quite a lot. And uh, we have to consider that this point here corresponds to this phenylalanine, which is very, uh, at the beginning of a beta sheet, the whole area here is very, very deeply buried in the protein matrix. And therefore, one would conclude here that if a kind of reorganization like this happens in the whole protein, then we at least should have a kind of misfolding of that beta sheet. So um, we are now working on, on this model in which uh, the imidazole ring instead is protonated on one of the nitrogen, and uh, uh, it's, uh, there is one of these uh, other nitrogen of the imidazole which is in between the two uh, subclusters. Uh, and it appears that this model should be a uh, little bit more realistic. We are going to compute also the energy of protonation, in some sense the pKa of this uh, residue here. But for the moment, I would say that uh, this kind of picture is much more consistent with a literature of uh, iron force for cluster available. It is um, this kind of coordination is very similar to another uh, case of iron four super four cluster coordinated uh, with histidine in nickel iron hydrogenases, and so uh, most probably we uh, will be able to conclude in the end of this study uh, that uh, as a whole, this result suggests that the presence of a histidinate bridge in the two subclusters is actually not uh, such a realistic uh, picture. So I would like, obviously, to thank uh, Ugo Cosentino and Giorgio Moro, who are in the audience. Uh, Maurizio Bruschi, also in my uh, new department uh, in uh, Milan Bicocca. Antonella Ciancetta was in my group when I was in uh, the UNICAT cluster in Berlin for one month, and now he's in uh, uh, Padua University in the group of Professor Moro. And uh, Alexander Pulesa uh, from Creative Quantum uh, GmbH. And thank you all for attention. Thank you, Dr. Greco, and there is space for a quick question. Yeah. Uh, hold on, hold on. Before you are defining this QM region and to reduce the system size, no, you told that uh, you are changing many of the residues to glycine to reduce the system size. So all the residues that you mutated were basically hydrophobic, or were there some re charge residues? In case there were charged residues, they were all mutated to glycine. All the ones that were pointing up uh, outside, let's say, the, uh, um, the model, all of those which obviously were interacting actually in the protein with uh, other parts of the protein were mutated to glycine. It was... In that case, are you sure that it will not have any effect? Because if you are changing a hydrophobic residue to glycine to reduce the system size, it's fine because they are similar. In case you replace a charge residue to glycine, are you sure that these charge residues don't have any effect on the So side? we also checked that whenever we changed the uh, charged residue with glycine, there was also an ion pair there, let's say. So basically, the charge, let's say, it's reproduced well in the model as a whole. Yeah. Thank you. Are there more questions? No. Okay, let's thank again our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.